nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Uh, thanks for uh, sir, inviting me to give a talk uh, and the keynote. Uh, I did not expect I would be the first one of the keynotes because I'm not really working on uh, cyber resilience area. Uh, but Sarb uh, has been encouraging me, saying, you know, you're, you're doing something quite relevant. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe it's relevant. Uh, let's see, you know, because, uh, you know, something hopefully gets some fresh air from some different researchers. Uh, plus, I, I'm coming from uh, Illinois. It's a pretty nice uh, short driving, one and a half hours coming to Purdue. I actually have a, a postdoc. Uh, she lives in Purdue, but every week she will drive down to UIC. Uh, we are doing joint research. So it's uh, Purdue and uh, UIC is always very close. So uh, my talk, essentially, since I'm working on data mining, I've been working on this uh, topic for many years. So it is somehow related to cyber resilience. Uh, I was thinking about it for, from the cyber re resilience point of view, is we try to make sure things will not break up, okay? So something, even you get some attacks or some bugs, things still could be running, okay? However, data mining is trying to, say, get a lot of data. Some could be really online data streams. Can we guarantee we can find something important, maybe we can prevent it, or maybe we can recover it. So if you think about this, we can think about uh, data mining may help. One thing is we can detect the adverse uh, events or something uh, from the point of view is like cyber attacks, whether we can find it. Or whether you get some bugs, we can find it or something. Uh, to some extent, it could be important, okay? So uh, today, my focus is on whether from the data, data mining point of view, wh whether we can find some unusual events uh, in a multi-dimensional space. So we first, I just give you an example of uh, years ago, we did some study on online data streams, whether we can find something unusual, we call, you know, outliers. The method we are using, uh, I thought about it, it works for low dimension space, but it may not work on very high dimension. Of course, today's talk, I will focus on the high dimension. However, I just show you one example in the low dimension, data mining may help if you want to find outliers. This example I just show you is this, okay. Suppose you got some training data, in the previous many cases, like every certain time uh, people market say something is outlier, okay? So if you look at this one, uh, the things are in the dark brown actually is outlier, okay? People can say this part of data, this is the outlier. And, but you know that for data stream things coming very quick, you cannot store all the data, you don't have time to check and build a model using all the data. So you have used samples, but how can we use samples? So if you think about, all R is always very small number. So what our uh, proposed one is, while you are, you, you are moving your data streams, okay, you probably can think about these all Rs are most important. The normal data, you know, later you will get similar kinds of data, similar kinds of distribution as well. So what our proposal is, if you look at those classification models at the, at the, in the past, you label some data, what you want to do is you probably just only want to save those outliers. Then you throw away all the previous data, okay, pre previous normal data. And at the time of like uh, the last one, last frame, okay, you still collect, you know, quite a bunch of normal data and outliers. What do you do? At the last moment, you want to get a very good model constructed. And our proposal is you merge all these, all our data. 
then you partition your normal data. You, your normal data is quite quite big. You partition them into suppose you partition them into k bunches. Uh, how do you get this k? This k could be, you know, you got all r, you merge all the all r, you get that big. You try to make reasonably evenly distributed. That means each k sample from your normal data is similar size, but you can build a K models. And these K models, you can do ensemble. In that sense, each model is quite small, but each model, you merge all the OLR cases. And they have different kinds of normal cases. Once you build this, you vote, likely you'll get right classification, you know, connected. So that's the reason we build this one. We actually test it. It's quite effective. Uh, we actually use in quite a few places. So that's why we say in the low dimension, try to find all ours may not be that hard. Of course, there are lots of different problems. Okay, this is just one example. In the low dimension space, we can do it. However, in the real life, there are lots of, lots of very high dimensional data. A typical high dimension data actually could be in the real life, you may get Data streams not only contain, you know, signals like uh, 1D, 2D, you know, those kind of signals, but you get uh, images, you get audio, video signals, you get text, you get all these kind of very high dimension data space. So with this high dimension, if we want still do multi-dimensional analysis, but in a very high dimension data sets could be very challenging. Okay. So in Today's talk, I'm not going to discuss images, audio, videos, but I'm going to just take text as, as an example because we have been studying this. I just say, try to find unusual patterns in the text. In the high dimension space, it's challenging, but it's also very interesting. The first thing I should say is, it's quite real. Just thinking about last, last uh, week, we got news. One news could be Boeing 737 MAX. You know, we, there were two fatal accidents, okay, two crashes. The other one could be New Zealand the terrorist attack. All these, you can say, those are unpreventable. Yes or no? Actually, it's not very certain. Years ago, we were funded by one NASA project. The NASA project that the people finally fund us, the NASA program manager, give us a very good example because what we were doing is text mining. What we do is we build up multi-dimensional text cubes, try to catch any potential flight incidents. So what they give us is flight in incident report database. But they give us one good example. They say in 2003, okay, in uh, New York airport, I think JFK, there was one airplane flew out quickly, it crashed. Because in 2003, people actually, the first thing thinking is terrorist attack. But they could not find a trace of terrorist attack because they could not see the, the plane got anything blow up. So they finally found, actually was the plane took off too soon, right after a huge airplane just took off. There were huge air turbulence. The flight, you know, the pilot could not see, the, the control tower could not see, but it's real, it's there. So then they went back to check years ago, any, you know, report, report something similar. They actually later found in this report database, not in the same airport, but right after a huge airplane took off, the pilot actually wrote, said, I feel a huge drag. I almost lost my control, okay? So they actually said, if this one found earlier, you know, fix is very simple. You just wait one more minute. Then they reset the rule, say, after this huge airplane, you have to have at least three minutes instead of two minutes. 
the other airplane could start running. So you probably can see text mining in this huge database. Why people did not find before? Because it just look at the size of this flight incident report. There are millions of millions of records there. People may not even pay attention. So that's the kind of thing. We do not know whether any MAX, 737 MAX, any pilot get any report there. But you can see is if you can do tax mining, you may save lives. So that's very important thing. You, you, you can see that's the reason we were interested in doing this. Now we get into our uh, flow charts. Many years ago, we have done a lot of, a lot of data mining from, you know, many different things. But in recent years, we work with Army Research Lab. They fund us and also NIH, they fund us. But they, those researchers give us a very, very important task is they want us to work on the text because you're just thinking about an Army report. They got millions of millions of piles of papers. Actually, I talked to Boeing people because once we got a workshop, the Boeing people came, said, you just look at 737. The documents, if you print out all the Boeing 737 documents in all the different languages, you will pile this one from Earth to the moon, seven rounds and a half. That many documents, just one Boeing 737. You probably can see, you know, if you want to mine this data, it's really huge amount, right? And how we can do this automatically? So you probably can see, uh, our starting point is we got a huge text corpus. We get Wikipedia general knowledge base. Of course, you can say human can, can labor it. It's too much work for human to do labeling. But Wikipedia, you can think it's a human already got lots of people did some kind of marking or annotation, right? And taking this, whether we can automatically get keywords, phrases, mind, types, entities, relations extracted, and whether we can construct networks, you know, type the networks and multi-dimensional text cubes, then we will be able to finally get, get knowledge out. So that's our flow charts. In my group, uh, for years, we work on this flow charts on different sections, different paths. We achieve something quite interesting. So I just to let you know, this is, you know, high dimension because text is very high dimension. High dimension, you can turn them into some kind of structures. And finally, you can turn them into low dimension text cubes and things can be mined. We did a few lines of work. I just show you one by one these lines. Actually, you may find it's quite interesting. The first thing is phrase mining. Why we have to mine phrases? You just think about this, okay. Single word, of course it may make sense, but in many cases, you give me one single word, it's very ambiguous, I do not even know what you're talking about. For example, if I t talk to you, say United, you will say, what is United? Is United Airlines, if in the airport you say United, I will not get confused. What about I go to United Nations? Is the United Kingdom or United States or United Arab Emirates or even UPS, right? So anything could be United. So you probably see single word is not a complete semantic unit. The minimum unit actually should be phrase. So, but how could you mine phrase, phrases? Just to give you a simple example, these are the computer science publication. In DBRP, there are more than two million titles. Okay, you look at this, this is say mark Corp blanket feature selection for support back machine. Okay, human can read it, you can read it. You are a computer scientist or electrical engineer, you say, support back machine, we use it. But suppose you came from Mars, how could you know support back machine? It's one phrase. So you, you look at this, the simple way even Martian can get it is counting. Suppose you know a little statistics, you came to Earth, you do not know support vector machine is anything. However, you got two million titles you can count. If you think about it, suppose 
each word appear one, you know, 0.1%. Okay, suppose you get support back machine, each one is one over a thousand times. You get two million titles, support vector getting together, one over a thousand times one over a thousand, it's one over a million, okay? Two million titles, support vector getting together, you expect to only get twice. However, you plow through, you see support vector got so many times. How, it is not, a, you know, like a random distribution, even normal distribution, you look at that part, you look at your Z score, or you know, anything you think like that. We know if a Martian knows Gaussian curve, okay? You know, you get three standard deviation away, the chance only is 0.3%, right? Now you got, if you look at our, you know, support vector getting to, together, it is 12 the standard deviation away. Okay, that means they glue together. What do you mean glue together? It's a phrase, right? You can think about this. You can easily find, you know, support vector machine getting together. It's a phrase. It's a good phrase. Then you will find even feature selection is a phrase. Okay. And not selection for. Actually, you, you actually can see we play this one. Actually, we do a little segmentation. That means you have two choices, feature selection, selection for. But you, you, you count the whole corpus. You will know selection for is a good. It's not as good as feature selection. You, once you take fe feature selection, the selection for the count will be reduced as well, right? The, as an independent count. So with this, we work out a very nice phrase mining algorithm based on statistics. Not based on the particular language, but the nice thing is it works for any language. So just give you an example, what do we need? Okay, what do we need is just a Wikipedia. Why we need a Wikipedia? Because a Wikipedia gives you lots and lots of positive examples. For example, you say Barack Obama is a phrase, or Donald Trump is a phrase, or United States of America is a phrase. It's given in Wiki, okay? How many will get? You can get 200,000 almost for free. However, they don't give you anything negative. They don't say this phrase. For example, we actually tried, we originally tried like a, a Obama administration. We could not find it. Of course, you extend it, you still can find it. But it's, you cannot find it, it's still positive. It's still the right phrase, right? So with this, we actually develop a method. We use random forest, and we actually, based on ensemble, we actually can get rid of the small negative one, that means we treat it not in the wiki as potentially negative. But this potential negative contains 10% noise. However, use, you know, random forest plus ensemble, you actually will get a high confidence because, you know, if it's, it's not a good phrase, you will be dropped out very quickly with this voting, with a lot of things voting together. Okay. So we got a very high quality on this. Just to show you the example, we only use Wikipedia. The interesting thing is, if you work on this language, you work on Spanish, you need Spanish Wikipedia. You work on Chinese, you should use Chinese Wikipedia. Except that everything is automated. Uh, you, you probably can see the precision recall curve. On DBRP, which is scientific literature, on Yelp, which is, you know, like uh, social media, on uh, English Wikipedia, Chinese Wikipedia, Spanish Wikipedia, all the curves are way higher. The two, two algorithms on the top are all ours. One is called sec phrase, one is called auto phrase. All the other algorithms, they, they got way below. And we can mine lots of high quality phrases and it's open source. It, it interesting is so many companies, once we do intern, we actually went down there, like we went to Google, okay, we found Google using it. We went to Facebook, Facebook using it. Microsoft actually collaborating with us there using it. The interesting thing, even those application company like uh, TripAdvisor, they actually send us an uh, interesting internal blog. They are working not only on one language, many languages, and it works so nicely. They basically use this, our auto phrase, 
integrate with Google's word to back And then they can do a lot of automated analysis on many languages, clustering, classification, nicely. So that's one thing on automated phrase mining. But once you mine the phrases, you still want to recognize what it is. But you don't want human to give lots of annotation because of course, there are people doing lots of annotation. You hire many people. Even NIH actually hire many people to, to do this biomedical literature annotation. But we want to say whether we want to use weak or very weak supervision. That means we also almost no, need no annotation, but we only want to use wiki. Okay. Can we do this? Just give you an example, like this one is from, from Yelp. Say so the, the best barbecue I've tasted in Phoenix, I have the pulled pork sandwich with coleslaw and a baked bean for lunch. It, human can read it, but Martian cannot, right? Because you, you, even you check dictionary, barbecue, it could be a machine which can cook, but you cannot taste a, a machine, right? So that means you must have a lot of ambiguity. You have to disambiguate them. Phoenix could be a bird, but it also could be a city. So with this, we actually work out something interesting is with this one, we work out using phrase mining plus potential entity linking with wiki and linking by themselves based on massive unlabeled sentences, corpus. With this, you actually can find, for example, like Washington. Washington has lots of different in, inter, interpretation. Washington could be a city. Washington could represent a state. Or it could, I mean, a, a country. Or it's, it's a Washington State or Washington Avenue, right? Or even Washington University or in St. Louis or anywhere. So what you can see is you use this, you link with all the context. For example, this Washington that has office at Washington is ally of Washington. Washington announces, Washington declares. With this, you probably will be able to figure out this Washington, what it is. Because once you say Washington declares, and the other one said Kabul declares or Moscow declares or something, you actually finally know Washington actually represents that country, right? So you, you, based on this, you will be able to disambiguate lots of things and to do this. Of course, this disambiguation is based on, you know, type propagation from the wiki. Prop, even it contains ambiguity, you can propagate the, the probability, okay, down there. Then you, based on the phrase, you can cluster them. Based on cluster, you can disambiguate them. So, uh, this method, we actually work out a very good methodology. We com compare with many people using substantial annotation. Actually, we can do better. Uh, the student work on this now, he become a professor in USC. And uh, last year, 2018, he got an ACMC KDD dissertation award, just because the, the work is well recognized as well. Another interesting thing is, you think you need, you know, annotation. Actually, if you get a massive unlabeled data, the annotation almost can be done by itself. You just, we just look at the things you may not be able to understand, but some other thing is easy to be understood. Then just give you an example. You look at the number one sentence that uh, President Blas Compare's government of Burkina Faso was founded something. Okay. That one, you probably do not know this country name. You do not know this present name. However, if we just do a little trans, you know, almost same thing, we just trans, replace the constants. For example, replace this blast compare by Barack Obama and this Burkina Faso by US. You actually can see the newspaper almost say this every day. Or you can, you can even Twist it around, you say US President Barack Obama visited something. You probably see, you know, at least uh, when we do, we did this was, you know, around uh, 2016. 
you press see the newspaper all the time. So, so what you can see is you can do a lot of pattern extraction. And what we call this one is a matter pattern. Because this pattern is not a concrete pattern, but you want to ch change, you know, a different name into a dollar person and a different country to dollar country. And then you will see exactly pattern matching. You will grab those patterns. You will find lots of very interesting things. Just give you an example of what we can find. We can find. This one is we come from the PubMed, uh, NIH, you know, uh, the, you know, they have a very big PubMed database with all the medical publications, more than 36 million, you know, research papers with all the abstracts available. We took this, we took the PubMed, we actually mined this, you probably can see the interesting thing is automatically you can cluster those patterns. You, you can see the patterns we found, we automatically clustered as Dollar treatment, this is the type dollar treatment, was used to treat the dollar disease. That means what treatment can treat some disease and all the similar things. Okay. Then with this, you actually can find lots of treatment with certain disease, those pairs. You can find huge number of pairs. You, if you look at this, this bacteria will resistant to certain antibiotics. And then you actually were, you go through the PubMed. Not only you automatically find this pattern, you automatically find those pairs. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, it, you, you can find lots of things and statistics and claims using this pattern mining approach. Another interesting thing is taxonomy. Okay. You may say, uh, People can construct taxonomy. People can use taxonomy. But in many cases, in your application, you may need a different taxonomy based on your data. Right. Can we automatically get this taxonomy constructed, extracted, or refined? Okay. So we studied this one using big data, and we actually can do, based on the large, you know, tax data, large corpus, you can automatically based on doing this word to back like embedding. Okay. I just give you the general idea. What is the uh, methodology? You look at the very top of those, the ball. If you just uh, based on phrase mining, some kind of entity extraction, then you can map from the massive text data. You map them using word to back. Actually, it's a little advanced word to get back. It means, VMF, uh, uh, VMF uh, is a uh, uh, Van uh, Mon Fischer, uh, F Fischer, okay? That person, he basically, I mean, based on this mapping, you will map all the text, the phrases, into a ball, into spherical, into a ball. The similar things will be clustered in certain place in the ball surface. For example, if you look at, uh, say, machine learning or computer vision or information retrieval, they will be clustered at different locations in the borrow place. The general philosophy is we actually, there are things clustered from nice cluster. There are things scattered in the middle. Actually, scattered in the middle, you should not force them to, to certain cluster because those middle one usually is a little more general thing. For example, you cluster those things, you find the middle. You look and check the middle one. They could be like algorithms, efficiency, scalability, you know, methodology or something. Those things actually doesn't belong to any cluster, but they actually belong to the top, belong to the parents. So what we did was something vague in the middle. Okay. We pushed them to the top. And leave the cluster actually clean, cleaner. Okay. Then with this, actually you find like a machine learning or a computer vision information retrieval in a much better way. And while you try to go down, for example, from machine learning, you go, try to go down to deep learning to, you know, CNN or something like this. You want to go down instead of using all the corpus. What we call is a local corpus. That means, once you study machine learning, 
you get rid of all the other things, you take all the corpus related to machine learning, then you redo the embedding. In that sense, you go down, you'll find better clusters. And I just show you some example like this. You probably can see this is all automate, automatically generated from the DBRP data. You generate, for example, you can see from the learning algorithm finally down to like neural networks, okay? And from neural network, you go down to deep learning, different parts of deep, deep learning. This was done automatically, okay? Of course, we are still refining the methods. But last year, we actually showed this in the KDD conference. People really think, you know, if you can do this automatically, it will be, you know, quite amazing. Then with this, we come back to the original NASA project I, sh I mentioned. Actually, NASA project is, they want us to construct the multi-dimensional space. For example, by time, by airports, by aircrafts, you know, by weather or something you can construct, you know, putting those, you know, like a uh, instant reports, like a maintenance worker or pilots, you know, put in the right place. Then you will be able to find a cluster and find a comparative things. Okay. This uh, multi-dimensional text cube we proposed has been very powerful. We actually show this, for example, uh, we just show like a landing at a LAX. And we found landing at LAX, you see the incident report, lots of people, lots of pilots actually complaining in the afternoon they land in the airport. It's very hard to see the runway. Just because the, 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 the ocean, the Pacific Ocean was so, so glare, right? You just cannot see the runway clearly. So that, that could be a complaint. Then you may think you, you may change the, the direction f instead of facing the ocean, you probably want to go the other direction, right? So that means actually you can see the incident report, the, the, the pilots, their complaints, very, very, you know, focused on different airports, different time. So with this, the problem is if we can put the documents into the right spots, it's great. However, who is going to put in into the right spot in this text cube? Nobody. Human can do it. Okay. But we don't want a human to do it because there are millions of such reports. Okay. So we want to find an automated method to, to put in. Just give you an example. Okay. Suppose you look at this one. This one said that the Super Bowl is on air from Chicago, Illinois. The NFL has decided the best coach in 2017. Okay. You look at this. We have a text cube. One dimension is time. One dimension is country. One dimension is the sea. Okay. This one, human can easily put it in because the humans say, this is the USA, this is sports, and this is 2017. Okay, you look at this, you say, I have no problem. How about machines? Can machine, because it doesn't mention anything about sports because it's NFL, Super Bowl, of course it's sports, right? But you say, Chicago, Illinois, of course it's USA. Why you cannot put in? Because the, the machine's not as smart as human, right? So the problem is whether we can develop an algorithm to make the machine as smart as human, you can put in the right place for all those kind of documents, no matter what they say. So that's a tough problem. Actually, for this problem, we developed a new embedding methods because we tried Google's WordVac or something similar, doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? You probably see, you know, because you think about it, USA, Illinois, Chicago, it's not always like a surrounding, right? There are so, people have so many different ways to say it. But we take the whole document, okay, as a one. So what our requirement is this, okay? You give me a cube structure, okay? One structure supposed is country. You only, you don't need to give us anything else. You only need to give us a label. USA, China, Russia, Germany, you know, you only need to give us this, nothing else. Can we put the documents, say this document is about USA, put into USA? How can we can do this? We have massive documents. They can help each other. This unlabeled one, very weak supervision. Only the label. Okay. Single one. 
And what we do is we take label, documents, phrases, first all embed into same space. You can see all embed into space, same space using something like a word to back. Yeah, and we, we embed it on there. Okay. What do we do? We're not going, at the very beginning, we're not going to say everything is right, everything is responsible. No. But what we do is we try to find the very best one. We know this one can help U.S., can help, you know, Germany to do the distinct distinction. So we do this embedding, and then what we do is we actually take the words, let all these words, phrases compete for each other, find the very best one. What is very best one? Some word is very good, identifies certain dimensions, certain values. Just give you one simple example, stock market. Okay, of course you know it. Stock market, the first interesting thing, you look at that dimension. China, USA, Russia, Germany, all these things. Every country has a stock market. So you look at the stock market, you look at those country. The stock market in those country label these documents, the distribution is relatively the same. Okay, it's very close even distribution. However, if you look at topic, economy, sports, politics, art, you clearly see the difference because stock market is related to economy much more, politics second, and all the others is very minimal. So you clearly see automatically stock market not belong to countries, but belongs to topic and belongs to economy. You probably can see, okay. With this, what you do is at the very beginning, you only have these labels, very sparse labels. However, you use this embedding, you compete, you, 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 you try to find the very best candidate first. You put in, then you enhance your labor. So, so I just give you an example. You look at this China. The first iteration we actually found Chinese. The second iteration we found Shanghai. The third iteration we found Beijing. Now you, you, you can see the power start growing because at the very beginning you only got one label. But now with all the candidates you start competing, you find the second best candidate put in, third best you can put in. Yes? Quick question. So at what scale is the text view being accepted? Sentences, values, documents? Yeah, the text cube structure is this, okay. Human can give you a, f a skeleton. The skeleton means one dimension in your text cube, one dimension could be year. One dimension could be country or location. One dimension could be theme, okay. But for each dimension, for each one, you give a label. That means for, for year, you may give, say, 2017, 2018, 2016, 2015. For, for country, you may give, say, Russia, you know, USA, Germany, China, you can give this as a label. The remaining one is massive unlabeled documents. What you need to do is doing this embedding. At the very beginning, this document, if you say China, you can see only this document contain the word China will be linked together. All the other words are not linked to it. But this labor linking with words with a document were at the very beginning sparse label. But with the embedding, because the embedding you, 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 like a word of back, those embedding, this not a word of back, it's a document. Document, word, label, embedding. With this embedding, you find something closer. Then you start picking up the best. You start propagating. I think maybe, uh, maybe I should rephrase my question is, does a single document go into multiple cubes? No. Single document, we... China and US in the same article. Yeah, that's good. That's a very good one. If you get uh, documents which are very clear, belong to, say, USA, you put it in USA. But once you get a multiple ones, you put on their parents. You, you cannot decide each one. Of course, you can pro proportionally you know, put in. Uh, for us, we just put on the parents. So in that sense, you, 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 you get documents classified. And once you classify these documents, of course, uh, this is one method. We develop another method is taking similar philosophy, but we use neural network approach. 
Uh, neural network approach means this. Okay, this is a newer paper. Uh, the newer paper, is, both all these papers were published in 2018. Okay, but this newer paper, uh, what we did was this: you can train either use label or use small number of key keywords or use documents. You can label some documents as well. And with this, you you first do the embedding, and then you kick in the generative model. It simply says. You use those generative model, take those embedded words, embedded phrases, you generate pseudo documents, and then you take the pseudo documents you feed in to neural network, like RNCN. We actually tried it, either RNCN or works well. And then you construct the classification model. But anyway, this philosophy is there. That means you try to First, pick the very, very high quality war. Then you start expanding. You expand it cons conservatively. And also, you can do this in, let me see the time. Yeah, you can do this in a hierarchical way. That means you can only, you know, you grab this hierarchical structure. You only give the labor to the leaf. And those cannot be in the leaf. They were pushed into the intermediate node. That's exactly like you say, it belongs to both China and USA, you push on the top. With this hierarchical model, you're going to push them on the top, in the middle, intermediate one. And then I just show you one example, because this is related to cyber resilience, I want to show. We did a one on the cyber thing, you know, could be interesting. But uh, before that, I first just show you, with the cube constructed, it becomes very powerful. One powerful thing we show is this one. The, the top one is 2016, the election. Okay, the, uh, people debating different topics, different party debating different topics. The interesting thing is, with this document put in the right place, you can do comparative summary. That, not, that means not based on frequency. If you're based on frequency, the, every, you know, summary will contain Trump and Hillary. Okay, of course, right? They mention this all the time. However, if you just based on these different topics, like a gun control, immigration, domestic politics on this thing, uh, actually this one was done before the, the, the final Trump, you know, d debate. We did this one in 2015. Okay, so there's no, uh, the war yet. Okay, <laughs> that, I mean, the Trump later gets say build a war or something there. But anyway, what you can see, you just look at the gun control, the phrase we grabbed and, and we ranked. You look at this gun control, the most important phrase is gun law, national rifle association, gun rights, background check, gun owners, assault weapon ban, mass shooting, high capacity magazines. A very good phrase. It's almost like human got it. Like a high capacity magazines, right? You, of course, this one is be before the Las Vegas shooting, but the high capacity ma magazine becomes one of the debating issue already. Right? So you, you, you see is with the document put in the right place, your summary can be very sharp. Actually, I did this. I went, uh, when we got this uh, NIH grant, we, I went to UCLA medical school, give a talk. I show the top one. The medical doctor got a very, very exciting. They say, we we'll give you a task. They give us, a, which task they give us? They say, you, you're mining the text. We have lots of text at PubMed. Give you one task. We work on cardiovascular disease, heart problems. That's their uh, UCRA, of course. They have lots of aged people in the area. Their heart is very advanced. What they say is this. They say heart disease actually six major categories. It's not just to say heart disease. They have arrhythmia, cardiomyopathy, you know, valve dysfunction. There are lots of things. What they say is every heart, the new one is you try to find the genes and protein. Which protein is close linked with which disease? You're going to treat that protein. To some extent, you can treat the disease. The number one, they actually know it. They don't tell us. They just say, you go down to PubMed, type cardiovascular disease, you will find lots of articles. They, they just say, last 10 years, how many you found? We say half a million. Okay. They say half a million, great. 
you have a half a million, you know, abstracts. What you need is we give you 250 proteins. Can you find, it's like those gun control, you can find mass shooting, assault weapon, you know, those very important phrases. Now we give you six different categories. We give you 250 proteins and their aliases. Find which one belongs to which. That means they want us to find the top, most important top five proteins related to one disease, but not the other. And we run our system for like nine hours. We give them everything. We give them top five. They said, oh, you did great work. We said, why great work? We said, we did not know anything. But they said, number one you got is all right because we treat those things. But number two, number three is what we want to find. We say, why you cannot find it? We say, half a million documents, many of them is a protein linked to everyone. Those proteins actually link to all kinds of problems, not only heart disease, also cancer, right? But not only one heart disease, too many. They want to do discriminative analysis, like a, or getting gun control rather than Trump, right? So they say you're number two, number three. For us to dig out this half a million will take us more than 20 years. But you take nine hours. What you got this is very important because they actually told us, one doctor told us, you're number two for that disease. Actually, it's ours. We strongly suspect this one may link to the disease because our number one treated for the heart patients, especially for children, young children. It doesn't work. They have no reaction. But we don't know what's the number two to treat. It's very hard to find. And you find a number two. And many of them, they treat back, was working on mice. But they say, this likely, if we treat this number two, it may work for somebody. So they actually really thank us for, for, for this analysis. You probably can see this is very useful. And also it's very interesting is this. We use this. The natural language processing people came to us, said, we want to automatically generate captions for the videos, okay? They got lots of video pictures. They want general captions. We say, you already have captions. They say, those captions may not work well because the caption is too specific, okay? Say, this particular woman was shouting on some, something, but actually, you, the whole thing is about a certain demonstration. They want to summarize it because there are about five videos. They want to summarize using one or two sentences to summarize it. There are so many things. But what we did was, we put this one into the cube, multi-dimensional cube. And different protests, they are in different slots. Okay, different time, different slots. And they have surrounding captions. You actually find the most distinguished phrases. You take those phrases to see which sentences contain most of these distinguished phrases. You just grab, grab them out. We do not coin any new sentence, but that sentence happens to be the most summative. Okay, they say, wow, you almost uh, automatically, like a human, you grab this most important thing because that's the most uh, frequent discriminant phrases. And the sentence contains this, right? So it's uh, pretty powerful. And then I'm sh going to show you, uh, we were, you know, we got into a DARPA project. The DARPA project asked us to study, they call social sim. They want to say the simulation for the social media. But social media, we cannot get other social media in massive scale. For example, Facebook or Google Plus, Google, you know, those, you know, those things, they, they, they don't give you massive data. The only massive data we can find is GitHub. Then we say we take the GitHub, we study whether we can do this multi-dimensional analysis, find something interesting. So GitHub, this is about cybersecurity, okay? The cybersecurity, you actually can see at the leaf, we can give a few key phrases. And then we take the, you, you probably remember the GitHub. I, I think you, you play with GitHub. GitHub has, a, everyone is a repo. It's a small entry. It's a repo. But repo, not everybody write down very clear description. Some write a very, just put a code in. Some put a paper in, uh, you know, whatever. So 
what we found is just give the leaf, we can construct the classifier, the classification. We can put the, the, the big number of repos down into the right one, some in the middle. You can see some documents like this one, you get, get a 6 1,000 documents in the cyber photography. This one on the bot service, the malware. There are some intermediate ones. With this, we get this hierarchy, you put it in the right class. The interesting thing is we study last 32 months. Study their activities in GitHub. The interesting thing is we found there are some peaks. You probably can see some peaks. And we call these peaks as a bursty activities. Then you see those, the bot service, there's a huge peak, right? You can see that in the 20 months, actually 20 months in July 2017 or 2016, there's a huge, you know, bursty activity. We want to see what, what, what's the bursty activity. Then we drill down. We actually found three sub ones. One called Leakerbot, another is Poke, Birdie, another is Poke, Mobet. These three is in 2016, August. We found this very bursty. And then it's interesting. We look at this bursty one we found. They all relate to Pokemon. What happens was this Pokemon actually released and then lots of people start discussing in the GitHub. Then the interesting thing is we go, went back. We found actually on the same time, Fox News actually said that the Pokemon, actually some people play Pokemon and get into military base, okay, which is dangerous. So that means actually this, the social media to capture unusual events using this hierarchical cl classification, it works. Of course, we, we do not find it in the real time. We found, this is 2018, we found it in 2016. But still, we found this birthday activity, we can't explain it, what happened, right? So, it's pretty interesting. So, finally, I should say is, currently we work with Army Research Lab. Uh, what they want us is, first get a massive data construct and knowledge base with all these things. Then you get a data stream right on on the in the real time, you feed in using this text cube. You try to claim some knowledge. That means you claim some knowledge right on the fly with massive new data streams. Okay, including documents, including social media. That's what we are working with them. So, in summary, what I say is, data mining for the high dimension space. You still want to turn them into low dimension one because you can explain that. But high dimension, you have to first do data mining, text mining, understand them, get into phrases, get into hierarchies, then get into classification, then you put them into multi-dimension, low dimension text queue. Then you can do very interesting analysis. Uh, hopefully this kind of thing may be useful for our cyber resilience analysis. So that's what my, you know, discussion. So I should, Thanks for all the funding agents, including NSF, including NIH, you know, Army Research Lab, DARPA. There are lots of companies, you know, uh, support us as well. Okay, thank you. So these are some research papers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, quality of writing is much more challenging, right? Uh, what we currently doing is not a really quality because we only get a phrases. Uh, the quality writing, you have to analyze grammar and there are lots of different uh, how to use this word instead of others. That's much deeper into computational linguistics. But this, this whole discussion definitely relate to overall NLP, natural language processing, because uh, uh, but the difference is the, our data mining approach try to use the minimum annotation. Simply says, 
you, you, you do not want the experts to spin because what they, they told us is this. Okay. If you mark, annotate 2018 New York Times, now you want to analyze 2019, you still, still have to redo the annotation. Yeah, because 18 and 19 could be very different. Yeah. So we try to say we just need a Wikipedia or those kind of a general knowledge base. Then we can use massive unlabeled data to try to figure it out. Your text mining uh, corpus that your text mining is being used on, if that can be manipulated by malicious adversaries, then how susceptible are these algorithms to making wrong decisions? Yeah, that's a very good, very challenging question. Okay. Of course, we based on statistics. If you only manipulate one or two very small number of documents, you won't affect the general conclusion because, you know, we based on massive documents to make it. So to that extent, it's kind of resilient, right? But if you, the, 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 the intruder get a lots of noise, lots of things putting in, it becomes challenging. And then if you have a previous knowledge base, somehow you will be able to compare them, contrast them. You may be able to find something strange. Okay. In that case, you may be able to handle some parts. You probably can see this is what Army, you know, research lab telling us to do. Actually, to do this is reasonably safe in the sense you start with, you, you probably can see, you start with massive documents the agent give you. Okay. You assume this actually is good. Then you start constructing a knowledge base, constructing the cube. Then once online, you give something, because we already have some model. Then the, the, the online one, you can only minorly modify the model. If your online one is substantially different from the general knowledge base, general things will work out. Then they were, they were, you know, signal a red flag or something, or say something unusual. That is a very good research problem. Yes. The talk was very interesting. Oh, thank you. But uh, these approaches are primarily statistical, right? That yeah. you are doing is like find the statistical pattern in various levels of identity. Yes. There are also theory of language, like Norm Chomsky and others, they talk about, you know, elements, phrases, and how they construct sentences, and then how each language has a clear structure uh, connected to the brain's ability to process information. Now, I wonder whether machine learning generally is not often interpretable for how it does things. Does the uh, theory have any role in terms of refining this or making predictions that if you saw this type of pattern now, in the future, you will see that type of pattern emerging from this class of actors. Uh, I wonder whether theory has any role, language theory has any role to play uh, in what you do. Yeah, that's a very good observation. Actually, the you probably can see, we, we use reasonably less uh, like a grammar or this kind of a linguistic theory. Uh, the reason is this, okay. Uh, we are thinking if you give me majority semantic rich phrases, even if you do not give us a rigorous sentence, in large cases we can figure out the category of your documents. That means no matter how you write it, but if you use those words in some way, in large cases, you belong to this category. For example, you just think about the NFL, Super Bowl, whatever you say, you know, it belongs to sports, belongs to US, you know, that's really certain, right? So to, to certain extent, we bypass the language construction. But there are some disadvantage, but there's a, some advantage. Advantage is, in the recent social media, like uh, tweets or something, they don't write good grammars. Okay, they write some broken grammars, but you still should be able to classify them, should be able to handle them. So that means the grammar. Actually, recently, the, even in computational linguistics, there are some debates on whether grammar is a king or the semantics or phrases is a king. Okay. So there are, uh, I, I read those kind of interesting debates because uh, if you look at Chomsky, 
uh, his theory was any nation you first work out grammar, then you work out the whole language. But some people in the recent literature I, I read, they say, no, you first work out the, the phrases. People, even they handicapped, they could not write, they could not speak good grammars, but they speak those broken phrases, people still understand what they're doing. Right? So that, that's uh, some kind of a showing. Even children, we, they first learn words before they really learn grammar. So, but anyway. I'm not a linguist, I cannot judge, but I think what we did was we focused on the semantics on those phrases or something, try to construct it. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's thank Jiawei. Okay, thank you.